Any questions? That was a stretch. Um, one of the first studies you talked about where there, I think it was like 30% of them, 30% um, of the chimps let their partner in when they didn't need to, um, where the oh, string okay. was close yep. enough yep. together. Yep. Yep. Um, and I'm curious, do you think that's just like an error rate or do you think it might be that they're trying to avoid the other chimp getting so upset when they don't let them? Because you have that negative reaction. That's an interesting question. So this is one of those dangers of showing videos. So we did, I did, we did not code negative reaction. Um, and it was an experiment done over 10, maybe scarily enough, maybe 15 years ago. So um, don't believe anything I'm about to say. But this is what I think is, uh, one, we need to code it. Two is um, I think those reactions were pretty rare. Uh, it's just that I show that because it's very funny. Um, and then um, two is that um, a lot of the errors actually were met by much more frustration than that. So I remember I was there while we were testing, and I remember Beluka runs in. He 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 uh, you know he pulls uh, sorry he lets out he lets out his partner, and he turns around and sees the ropes are spread, and he has a total temper tantrum because he's realized that oh my god I didn't have to let the guy out um, you know I could have done it myself, um, and so we had as many of those reactions as we did the other. So. Uh the the category of in group stranger mm -hmm. is uh, I can see examples for uh, so I'm I'm thinking back uh, obviously the way I do in terms as you might uh, that uh, not in the modern world but ancestrally sure. with small very po small population mm -hmm. social structure and so on and there it's a sort of barely viable concept right mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but I think for bonobos uh, and chimpanzees, and I try to think, what's an in-group bonobo who I is a stranger that I, I encounter so often that that's a the class of which I encounter so often that that's a selection pressure to evolve tolerance, and that doesn't seem to make exactly a lot of sense. So then I flip it and I think, ah, okay. Uh, in the chimpanzee contrasting case, mm -hmm. there the the intergroup conflict is so harsh mm -hmm. that now it might be maybe talking about a setting defaults, not tolerance of in group, but you start you only attack when there's a reason to attack, and that with that, with chimpanzee evolutionary history, the chronic low level warfare, if I may, uh, is such that your default has to be set that you know. Uh, Zero sum, negative sum. I don't benefit when they benefit. So, so uh, you know, uh, I, I'm just trying to make sense of the, sure. the, the, the this category of if if that's an area of big difference. Yet, if one has a hard time thinking of a instances ancestrally of events in that category, then that's mm -hmm. a, that's a problem. Okay, so I'm just trying to square that problem. Sure, absolutely. So, so the. Um, uh, you know, the, in the case of thinking about bonobos and uh, chimpanzees, uh, I mean, the challenge we usually get is, well, wait a second, you know, we don't believe it that they really share with strangers and, you know, you need to do your experiment again because that's impossible. Why would you help someone you're not related to, blah, blah, blah. And the argument is, well, if you take a functional perspective and if it really is the case that as we continue to watch bonobos, um, and I, I, based on my experience with them and with chimps, I have a pretty strong prediction that they're, you're not going to see bonobos hurting or harming each other the way that chimpanzees do with lethal aggression um, in any you know, degree uh, that, that you see in chimps. Um, I think what you've got is you've got a, a, real, a total relaxation of uh, a cost where um, you know, the cost of meeting a stranger is, well, maybe they have diseases or you, know, you might get injured, you, know, you may even get killed. Um, and I think now when bonobos meet one another, um, what you've got is uh, a, a total change in, in the cost benefit of your interaction, where the major cost of interacting with strangers, or at least group members, or non-group members, is you know, gone now. Um, you might have been prey, and now you're not. 
And so now there's really a disease and there are a few other things that may be a cost, but uh, I think that the benefit uh, outweighs the cost. So I think, though, that in the case, my guess is that in the case of bonobos and chimpanzees, the only thing that they're, uh, and, and these experiments haven't been done, um, but my guess would be that when you show them pictures and videos, um, what they're going to be responding to, uh, as to whether they see that as a stranger or not, is, um, you know, do I, have I seen them? Have I heard them? Have I physically interacted with them? Um, you're not going to be able to cut their hair in a certain way or have them wear a t-shirt and one not wear a t-shirt and suddenly like, oh, I don't, I've never seen that guy, uh, but he's got the t-shirt I wear, um, so I'm cool with him. Um, and so um, I think that is a human phenomenon. And um, I take your point that, um, uh, you know, I certainly would, would bow to um, people in this room and other places who study hunter-gatherers, foragers. Um, but uh, even if it's the case that um, hunter-gatherers do not have many interactions with what I think we'd call an intergroup stranger, we still have to explain, well, where does that come from? Um, my guess is that somehow it was shaped in EEA or at ARE, um, but uh, um, you know, if you had ideas about it having more recent origin, that'd be cool too. Or maybe it's a byproduct of something else. But, but uh, I mean, my guess is as you have uh, more groups interacting, um, or as population uh, is exploding over the last 100,000 years uh, in our species, um, you have uh, an increase in um, uh, spread of you know, in innovation, et cetera. Um, uh, you may have an increase in tolerance towards your neighbors uh, and um, relative, as long as you have some, some way to, to identify them as like you in some way, uh, you're going to be tolerant enough to exchange ideas in a way that, um, you know, it would be hopeless for bonobos and chimpanzees because they, they don't even have that social category. That's the idea anyway. And if I could just... Uh ask a slightly parallel question, which is, uh, so first of all, this is fantastic work carried oh, out with incredible precision in a way that, so when I followed this literature from a greater distance, I was always frustrated that people hadn't done key controls and hadn't done yes. the retest, and here it's all, that's, that's why when some you said, are you any questions? I didn't have any questions. <laughs> it's also well done and clear. Anyway, but uh, but so again, it's a parallel question about uh, so they can cooperate uh, dyadically at least uh, and plausibly more than that, um, and with all the little sort of support elements of uh, bargaining and mind reading and mm -hmm. so on. Okay, so the question is. Uh, I'm again trying to think of, uh, you know, if you go into uh, chimpanzee and bonobo habitat that's characteristic for long periods of time, uh, not doing that myself much just as a tourist, right? Uh, the, uh, but still watching a lot of film and people like, uh, people talking about it and showing it, they don't, I'm not, you're not overwhelmed by the number of ecologically valid cases where they need each other's cooperation to oh. do minor things and so on. Uh, so, so one, one question is, is this the product of selection for, because it massively increases their ability to forage, or uh, is, it, is it a byproduct of something else, right? And so like, for, for example, intergroup competition or something. Um, and so that's, that's my question is when you see foraging and subsistence activities, do you see them uh, pursue things uh, with highly interdigitated social uh, mind reading mutuality? So, so let me, um, uh, can I show you one more experiment to answer your, okay, all right. So um, the, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Here it is, okay. So uh, Mike, and Felix Varnikin and Mike Tomasello uh, published uh, a paper arguing that um, uh, basically infants 
have shared intentions. Uh, they develop, and humans develop the ability to, I understand that John and I have the same goal. We're just trying to understand the truth, and we're trying to understand the data and think about the past and et cetera and how it may have shaped now. Um, so we have the shared intent to understand the truth, and so that means we can adjust. Oh, he didn't understand me, uh, so I need to show this experiment or whatever else, okay? And so that's what really sets up our ability to collaborate and communicate the way that our species does and others don't. So um, uh, the experiment here is young infants are given these very simple tasks, uh, or really they're games, um, and uh, they just basically play uh, a game where you can't play it by yourself, but it's a game. There's no real goal. Um, you just kind of do it together. Uh, and this thing, you know, uh, you pull it open usually. You open the thing and you can see the kid gets frustrated because the experimenter stops and says, hey, you're supposed to pull it open. I'm pointing to you, I'm producing, I'm understanding that you're not sharing my intent, I'm communicating to re-engage, then they do this thing together, okay? So your question was, all right, but in their natural, um, in, in, uh, and so Mike has argued that, look, we are just prepared to do these silly things together, and it's partly a motivational story, but it's also partly uh, a, a cognitive psycholo or social psychological story. Um, so I didn't agree with their, um, chimpanzee work because it said none of the three chimpanzees, they only tested three chimpanzees first of all, had any interest in playing the trampoline game and could not be enticed to do so. So they had, and in this tube game, same thing. They had a series of games and the truth is, so they say the chimps don't do it, they don't have shared intentionality. But if you watch all the videos, like I did, and I'm good friends with them, uh, and I said, hey, can I watch the videos? I, you know, I'm thinking about trying to replicate or do something else. Um, and none of the chimps played any of the games. So how could you have a failed shared intentions result if they didn't even play any of the games? There was, they, they, were, they weren't even playing the games to share intentions about. So basically, uh, my argument was, y'all had lame games. <laughs> so you know we need to have some better games. So we went to Congo, my wife and I, and um, we were like, we can do this. We can come up with better games than that. And we're going to make it, and I told you the story of making it simple and elegant. So we took a ball. And we said, let's just play catch. Let's throw a ball back and forth and see if we can do it. And we had access to infant chimpanzees and bonobos, so we thought that we could get them to do it. It was a nightmare. Let me tell you what a chimpanzee or bonobo does when you toss them a ball. They grab the ball and they climb up the closest tree. And, they, and then you know, chimps bite it and bonobos do something else. Um, and they're not really interested in doing the thing together with you. So back to your point about, well, how often would, would they actually show these? So I'm not really answering your question about need. I'm answering a question about, well, what is their proclivity, uh, their natural proclivity? So I, we did get them to play ball with us. But they have to be behind a gate. And they can't run away with the ball. And then Koyamba will play with us. And then we do our interruption. And you can see he's, oh, you're not going to play anymore. And this is where it gets really muddy. I don't know what this means, the next. We coded it, but I still am not convinced. Did he look up? Did he try to re-engage? I don't know. I don't really know. We kind of said, well, no. We don't have any evidence they did re-engage. But you saw he kind of looked up a little bit. He did kind of give the ball back. Um, and so you might, you might argue, well, he, I mean, if you were a big, you know, we are shared and, you know, it's all dissent, whatever, and not modification, you'd say, well, you know, that's enough. They did shared intentions based on that criteria. Um, we were trying to be conservative, so we said, eh, we don't really know. We, we kind of left with our hands up. And then Mike and, and Felix ran off and did a whole bunch of other examples where uh, kids are way more sophisticated in their analysis than uh, what we could hope to do with chimps and bonobos. So I do think there is a difference there. Um, but I just show you that as we had to put this gate here to play a game together with them. I think that tells you something. Um, you know, I cannot play catch with a bonobo or a chimpanzee. You can't do it. Um, and we had other studies where they had a choice when objects were you know, secure. They could play with one secured object by themselves and another secured object together with you. And they do prefer to play with you. So they'll come to your, the place you're playing, and they don't want to play by themselves. But their number one preference is to take the thing for themselves <laughs> and go run off. OK. So I don't know if that helped, but. Time to stop. Um, you may have noticed there were no refreshments today. Yeah. That was part of a controlled condition for an experiment <laughs> we're running. <laughs> Next week, we'll have refreshments. Nice. Our hypothesis is that you will return. So, non differential rewarding.
<laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll do the analysis. Yeah, right. It's going to be a real-time experiment. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you all.